tip from the hip. Don't eat quinoa just before recording a podcast episode. <laughs> Welcome to Food for Thought, the podcast all about living compassionately, healthfully, and sustainably with joy and abundance. My name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. I'm your host. You can learn more about who I am and what I do by visiting my website, joyfulvegan.com. This episode of Food for Thought is brought to you by the listeners of this podcast, and that means you. You can show your support for this podcast by becoming a patron. Just go to joyfulvegan.com slash donate or patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goodrow and choose the level that's right for you. Thank you so much in advance. Today's topic is how to eat like a vegan Italian, how to eat like an Italian vegan style, whether you're in Italy or not. Basically, we're going to talk about the food rules in Italian that are taken very seriously. Eating quinoa before a podcast episode is not one of them, just spoiler. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Food for Thought. I hope you're doing fabulously well. I am recording this episode. Well, I'm recording this episode in the eighth week of healing from my fractured ankle. I think by the time you hear this, I'm not sure where I'll be. And we are leaving in just a few days for our joyful vegan trips to Italy. We are running our trip to Tuscany and our trip to Northern Italy. Our effective communication and advocacy workshop was last week, and that was a huge hit. I look forward to hosting more online workshops like this one, so please let me know what you're looking for from me. Half of the 50 people who registered, and this was a last-minute workshop, this is clearly a topic people are interested in. They knew they weren't going to be there live. And so the intention always was for the video presentations to be replayed either as a video or you can even download it as audio um, and then be able to offer it to you. So it is up at joyfulvegan.com if you're interested in experiencing three hours of video presentations and questions and answers about compassionate communication and effective advocacy, go get yourself that workshop. So go to joyfulvegan.com. You can click on events. You'll find it. I know you will. We have a couple spots remaining on our idyllic French countryside joyful vegan trip that's coming up in September of 2023. Don't miss out because we're not running that trip again anytime soon. We also have space on our magical Alsace, magical Christmas, it is magical Alsace, magical Christmas trip to Alsace, our joyful vegan trip in December of 2023. Also not running that one again anytime soon. So don't delay. You can join me in Paris and the Loire Valley and the Dordogne Valley. And we end in Bordeaux in September. You can join me in Germany and France and Switzerland on the Christmas trip in December. So just go check out joyfulvegantrips.com. The details and the booking links are there. And over there, you will also find that we have just announced Joyful Vegan Tuscany and Joyful Vegan Northern Italy for 2024. And by the time you hear this, it might be sold out because today we announced our Joyful Vegan Japan and the demand was so high. I'm not kidding. Within a few minutes, I um, we might be sold out by the time you hear this, but we will run that trip again. I promise you, but go to joyfulvegantrips.com and you can see everything over there. So let's get started with today's episode. So this episode is not about what to eat necessarily when you're in Italy. I already made four episodes on the cuisines of Italy in the south, in the north, in the central part of Italy, and I even broke out central Italy to Tuscany on its own. What today's episode is about are the food rules, <laughs> food and drink rules that are really, really, they're taken very seriously. They're taken very seriously by Italians. And so, of course, I'm going to be focusing on the food rules and the drinks that have to do with being vegan and obviously not eating animal products. And you can implement these in your own life. Obviously, there are definitely things that I have taken from our travels to Italy or anywhere. Frankly, I take something back home with me 
everywhere we travel, and I have incorporated them into my life. One of the questions I ask everyone when we start a Joyful Vegan trip at our welcome meeting, I always ask, what do you want to bring to this trip? What do you want to bring, right? What do you want to bring to it? And what do you want to take home with you? And sometimes people say things that are very literal, like they want to take home wine, they want to take home olive oil or a baby gorilla. <laughs> if, we're in, if we're in Rwanda, you're not going to get to do that, but people say they want to do that. Um, but obviously the answers are often less tangible. I want to take home memories. I want to take home a sense of relaxation, a sense of community. I want to take home new friendships, that kind of thing. I want to take home new habits. And for me, for sure, I have picked up many things from all of our travels, especially when we go to Italy and I have incorporated them into my life. So the question I'm going to ask you at the end of this episode is what, From this episode and the food rules that I'm talking about, would you want to incorporate into your own life, whether you've been to Italy or not, whether you're going to join us on a joyful vegan trip to Italy or not, it doesn't matter. I just think it would be really fun so you can hear about um, kind of what these food, food rules are that Italians take very seriously. Seriously, you could attempt to speak Italian, and you should when you're in Italy, and not be judged for any mistakes you make. When it comes to food, different story a lot of judgment. (laughs) Just kidding. But there is. Uh, So I thought you'd appreciate knowing how to blend in like an Italian by adhering to some of their rules and being sure not to break others. So I want to first talk about the different types of establishments because it's not as straightforward as you think. And knowing about the diverse range of food establishments when you're in Italy will enable you to more effortlessly experience the desired dining preference that you're looking for, right? So here are the common types of food establishments in Italy. First, you have ristorante, you have restaurants, just restaurants, right? These are formal, they tend to be formal, full service restaurants. They offer a wide selection of dishes. They usually have a more extensive menu and the experience, the dining experience is a bit more refined definitely featuring traditional Italian cuisine, definitely featuring regional specialties. And we're going to talk about that because that's a big one. They are known for their attention to detail, the professional service, elegant ambiance, white tablecloths, and that kind of thing. So that's a Ristorante. A trattoria, trattori uh, are casual family style eateries. So if it's a if you see trattoria, you're gonna know it's gonna be a much more relaxed atmosphere, much much more homey. And they serve typically traditional rustic Italian dishes. So again, local and seasonal, but more rustic. They have a smaller menu. It probably varies daily. And again, there will be classic regional fare, but simple, hearty flavors. Then you have an osteria or taverna. So osteria or taverna, they are Also kind of cozy traditional establishments, they focus on simple homemade food as well. Now, traditionally, originally, Osteria um, were taverns, so that's why they could be either one now that they they tend to be used interchangeably. You might see Osteria more than you see Taverna these days, and they were originally taverns that primarily served wine, but they've evolved to include a variety of food options. They're usually small plates kind of aperitivo kind of thing um, to accompany the wine. They might not necessarily have a menu, might be a chalkboard with some things you can just order off of the the chalkboard. And so think of the Osteria as a kind of a wine bar with some food, right? Kind of that kind of thing. However, there is something called an Enoteca. So E-N-O-T-E-C-A, Enoteca, which is different than a taverna, and it is specifically kind of like a wine bar uh, or a wine shop. They will offer a wide selection of, of wines, mostly regional, mostly Italian, and they will give you a few aperitivi. You're going to get some uh, small plates, but you're there for the wine, you're there for the company, you're there for the conversation. But that's an Enoteca, is a wine bar. Now, you've got your pizzeria, right? And of course, pizzeria, they are, um, pizzerie, are casual. They serve mostly pizza. <laughs> um, mostly, depending on where you are in Italy, they'll feature different types of pizza. But you're typically going typically to get like a thin crust uh, pizza with a variety of toppings. And they're casual you can sit down. But then you have something called a pizza 
al taglio. And a pizza al taglio, which means pizza by the slice, taglio means cut. Uh, this is very popular really popular at lunchtime. They're, the pizza is usually rectangular or square, and they're baked in large trays, almost like picture like a focaccia, and then pizza toppings. And they're sold by the weight. So you can just get one piece of, of the pizza al taglio, and you can just carry it away. You can, that's the, probably the only time you are permitted to walk around and eat on the streets of Italy would be having a pizza al taglio. So you can go there, quick lunch, walk around, eat your eat your delicious pizza, and Bob's your uncle. The next most important food establishment is the gelateria. This is where you will find gelato. Gelato shops are all over Italy and they serve a wide selection of delicious flavors. I'm going to get into the specifics about gelato when we get there. That is one of the food rules that I want to talk about. And so, of course, you're going to find just gelato in those. Now, something else that's very interesting, which you might not be aware of, is you have a lot of bars in Italy, but bars are not places where you drink alcoholic beverages. Bars are cafes. They're not what we call bars in the U.S. We call bars, we call food establishments, where we call establishments where it's primarily coffee, cafes, and we call bars places where you can get alcoholic beverages. So it's not the same in Italy at all. So a bar is a cafe, and this is a place to grab coffee. It, they're also social hubs for Italians, and this is where you can get some pastries, um, maybe some you know little sandwich snack, that kind of thing. But it is they're there specifically for coffee, and we will talk about coffee as well. And so those are just your your general kind of categories of food establishments you will find wherever you are in Italy, wherever you are. So let's talk about the rules now, whether you're eating in a ristorante or in an osteria, wherever you're going to be eating. I think I already I think I already added a 16th because I have 15 ways to eat like an Italian. But the 16th would be do not walk and eat. Don't walk on the street and eat. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. However, I did say the pizza I'll tell you is one rule that is an exception. There's there are always exceptions to the rules. So number one, there's no exception to this rule. <laughs> number one, respect regional specialties. There's a reason I made that four-part series on the cuisines of Italy, because you literally can cross the border from one region to the next and find completely different food, completely different di- dishes, completely different menu items, completely different food specialties. So what does that mean for you and wanting to blend in as blend in with the Italians? If you're American, I'm going to obviously be speaking mostly from an American perspective because I am in the United States. And so what does that mean? That means, for instance, not looking for in restaurants menu items that are typically Italian American dishes, for instance. There's no such thing. I mean, Italians don't eat spaghetti and meatballs. Now, vegans don't either, even though we can get vegan meatballs. But spaghetti and meatballs, not a thing in Italy. Fettuccine Alfredo, again, not vegan, but the point is it, it's not a thing in in Italy. Even garlic bread, and we'll talk about that. So it means making an effort to go to restaurants where you're going to be supporting and celebrating the local regional cuisine, right? So you'll listen in that series, each region has its own unique dishes. Liguria has pesto, um, Naples, you've got your pizza, right? Neapolitan pizza. Uh, in Sicily, cannoli. In Milan, you you know, was where we first found uh, risotto alla milanese. So you're be, you're being mindful that you're not going to find necessarily something you loved in Milan down in, you know, Calabria. So it's being mindful of that and, you know, asking your server what they recommend is one way to do that. But also kind of knowing what to look for to avoid the tourist traps is another way you're going to look for that. And I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that you can never have pizza when you're in Milan because pizza is originally from Naples. (laughs) So I'm not saying that, but there are things that you can do 
to, to detect whether you are being lured into an inauthentic restaurant or not. So first of all, you're going to see a lack of regional specialties on the menu. So you're looking at the menu and you're like, oh, there's not a lot here that's, that's local to where I am. Right, and that's why you listen to that episode, so you get to know that a little bit more. But also, if you find a such a huge variety of dishes on the menu that it's just kind of a mishmash, and if you're finding things like fettuccine alfredo, and again, you're not going to order being vegan, but if you're seeing fettuccine alfredo, spaghetti, and meatball, things that would attract, say, an American audience or North American audience, that's kind of a red flag. So look for that. Another way to know it's a tourist trap and not an authentic restaurant is if there are photos of the food on the menu. That's definitely a red flag. (laughs) If the menu is available in a lot of languages, it's just not going to be an authentic locally owned Italian restaurant. Authentic local eateries are going to have menus in Italian. Maybe a limited translation in English and maybe some other languages, but for the most part, it's going to be in Italian. The other thing that's going to be a real a real tell is if the staff is outside standing around being pushy, trying to lure you into the restaurant, approaching tourists on the street. Those are all ways to know this is not an authentic restaurant because typically the genuine restaurants rely on reputation, word of mouth, and the local clientele. You will tell if it's a an authentic restaurant if there are local clientele there. So if like, you know, kind of look for a local presence and you'll be able to tell, you know, kind of right off the bat. And then also typically speaking, if you're looking to eat and you're on the main piazza of whatever city you're in, you're going to be surrounded by tourist restaurants. Like that's just the truth. So get off of the main piazza when it comes to eating. You know, we've had a pet TV and we've had, you know, drinks on some piazza because, you know, they're incredible and historical and beautiful. But when it comes to food, we would never eat a proper meal uh, at a restaurant on the piazza. You're just not going to find the, the good authentic restaurants. So get on the side streets and that's where you're going to find the restaurants. Okay. So the first way to eat like an Italian is to respect the regional specialties and go to the four-part series to know exactly what those are in the regions of Italy. And to answer your question, there are 20 regions in Italy. <laughs> there are 20, there are 20 actual regions, but like I break up the episodes to, you know, from the south, like I said, the north, the central part, and then I break out Tuscany. Number two, dine when the locals dine. Italians follow very specific dining schedules that differ from those in the United States. I will confess, this is a challenge for me. I I meet the challenge very quickly when I am in Italy, but at home, I am one of those people. I know. I'm very curious to know what your dinner time is. I eat dinner at 6 o'clock. Very early. Presto. Very early. Italians would never do that. <laughs> like, In fact, you're going to find most places closed between, well, certainly you're going to find places closed after three o'clock, four o'clock. You're going to find some places start to open maybe around five because there might be a pet TV. But for the most part, Italians eat dinner, like a lot of Europeans, around 7, 38. That's even early compared to like Spain. But if you're in Italy, you you can expect to eat dinner around 7, 30, eight o'clock onwards, right? Lunch is usually around one to three. So be mindful of that. If you go to a restaurant and they're opening full service by 5 p.m., you're again, you're not in an authentic restaurant. Now, if you're in a hotel or larger cities, obviously there's going to be more flexible dining options. If you're really hungry, there are places you can find a snack or again, a pet TV at five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. <laughs> this is the time for a pet TV. So you can certainly do that. But just know that you might have le- subpar quality, it may not be very authentic. It's probably going to be more expensive if you are looking to eat dinner at five or six o'clock. So when I am in Rome, quite literally, when I'm in Italy, I do as the Italians do, and I do eat late. And all of our, on all of our trips, we are obviously honoring the time of the Italians, even though I promise you, you will never starve because we are feeding you throughout the day. <laughs> so speaking of of dining and times, I broke this one out separately because I want to talk about breakfast separately. But breakfast is usually eaten around, you know, between like 7 and 9 a.m. And breakfast for Italians is very different for North Americans than North Americans. 
I mean, North Americans are obviously eating way more than they should be at breakfast time because, you know, when you think about a typical American breakfast, it's eggs and it's bacon and it's sausages and it's French toast. It's like really heavy breakfast and and mostly savory. So when you think about the bacon and the pancakes, even though you're putting the sweet maple syrup on, those are savory breakfasts you will never find in an authentic Italian well, I want to say restaurant, but like just at the bar, like that's just not what you're going to experience. Italian breakfasts are very light. They're pretty uncomplicated. They're pretty quick and they focus on carbs and caffeine. Carbs and caffeine is what the Italian breakfast is all about. So if you are in Italy and you are tooling around, do as the locals do, enjoy a morning pastry and a coffee at the nearby bar, at the local bar, at the, you know, at your neighborhood bar. There are sometimes, there's sometimes outdoor seating. It depends on where you are. So you can sit down, you can sit down and have your coffee, but coffees are, because it tends to just be espresso or might be a macchiato, you're not sitting there with, you know, with a grand, I'm saying grande, like I know what I'm talking about because I don't drink coffee, but I know that typically <laughs> uh, in the United States from a Starbucks or from a, from coffee places, there's a big mug, right? And you get your cafe latte or whatever you get. And you sit down and you sip it and you drink and you talk to people. That's kind of very different in Italy. There's the talking of to people because it's definitely a social experience as well. But you're not sitting there. It's a very quick experience. You're kind of taking your shot of espresso. You're drinking it. You might talk to someone at the bar, have a coronet, cornetto, um, and that's and that's it. And so if you want to look like an Italian, <laughs> a local, then you're going to want to go. You go up to the bar. You get your espresso. You get your macchiato. Uh, you get your pastry. And then you're pretty much done. As I said, you can still go sit outside and still people watch. That's something we love to do. But that's what an, that's what a, an Italian breakfast is typically like. And those pastries are usually the uh, cornetti. I mentioned the cornetto. That's that's basically an Italian croissant. So you get brioche. Um, there's lots of different Italian pastries. You're not going to find them vegan. I'm going to be really honest in most places. But you will on a joyful vegan trip, truly. Something also to know when you are going to a bar to get your coffee is you typically go to the counter first and you pay and then you get a ticket and then you go over to the person making the coffee and you give them the ticket and they make your coffee for you. So just tip from the hip there. So that's number three, eat breakfast as the Italians do. Number four, obviously if you're in a hotel and you want a bigger breakfast, you can do that. For our, for our trips, we have buffets, which is not very Italian at all just not at all. We are definitely catering to kind of our travelers because most of them are Americans, North Americans. We have some obviously from the UK, from Australia, but still same thing. We're catering to our audience, but the big breakfast that we serve on our trips, typically not something you would experience in um, by Italians. So number four is ah, the best, one of the best things. And one of the things that I think I already incorporated into my life prior to falling in love with Italy, but I definitely do it even more so now. And that is just savoring the pace of the long Italian meal. So breakfast, I said, was pretty quick. People go to the bar, get their coffee, get their pastry. They have a chat with a friend and they go about their day. But when it comes to lunch or dinner, Italians invented the art of slow dining. Meals are savored conversations flow, time is enjoyed. They're social events. They're meant to be savored. They're meant to be shared with family and friends, and they can go on for hours. <laughs> so relax and enjoy and avoid rushing through the courses. Do not request hurried service. It is not Italian. <laughs> it's just not It's just not what it's about. Enjoy and embrace the leisurely dining experience. It's just incredible. It's really one of my favorite things. And I have a lot of favorite things about Italy. It's one of my favorite things. And I have my, some of my favorite memories from any of our trips prior to doing the joyful vegan trips, our own personal trips, whatever, whatever. Some of my favorite memories are being in Italy and just having four hour long lunches, five hour. I mean, they go on and on. They're absolutely amazing. And you will definitely experience that on our um, Italy trips, especially uh, in Tuscany. The Tuscany trip is all about just 
oh my God, they're so amazing. And, and Italians have a term, well, there's a, there's a Spanish term, sobremesa, uh, and it's a Spanish concept, but Italians take it on too, and that refers to the time spent lingering at the table after the meal. A sobremesa just means over the table. There's no direct English translation. It just means time spent after a meal, hanging out with family and friends, enjoying everybody's company. And this could be at lunch or dinner. It could be even a business lunch. <laughs> but it just means relaxing and conversing and enjoying, not rushing. And indeed, this is not one of the rules, but I would say you probably want to consider this a rule. So okay, now I'm giving you 17. And that is to make a reservation prenotazione because it is like it really is a thing where if you are with friends you could be at that table for four hours five hours they they will let people be in the restaurant that long and so you having a reservation is going to help you get that table because you're not going to stand around waiting because you'll be waiting for a long time <laughs> so make a reservation if you can you don't always have to make a reservation we have certainly been in many many towns and cities and villages in italy where we didn't have a reservation we just walked in but if it's a nicer place and it's a place you really want to try um i would definitely recommend making a reservation i love this i will tell you that you know i covid was something that really messed with us in many 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 ways one of the things i really really don't like that has kind of stuck i've noticed is having a limited uh, time being at a table in some restaurants. So Millennium, my beloved Millennium restaurant, who I love so much, but they still have this 90 minute like max for you to be at the table. And I mean, they're not, I, we were there just recently and I saw a, a table of people who were there when we arrived and 90 minutes later, they were still there and we were still there. We left maybe within, I don't know, less than two hours, but I don't like that. I just the idea that we have to be mindful of the time. For me, that's not what sitting down and being either with my beloved David or being with friends or family. It's about the time spent together and the leisureliness of that. And so it's one of the things I really appreciate about Italians. Now that happens at home, obviously. You know, Italians are not really eating out as much as we. I, I'm, I'm kind of making it sound like eating at home is a huge thing in Italy, especially lunches and dinners. So at home, it's the same thing, just being together for four or five hours. Like that's what it is. And, and I I will say that that is something that I have definitely incorporated into my life. I have a lot of social engagements here at our house, and I just love the time we spend with our friends, and, and our parties do go on for for quite a long time, or even our dinners, sitting at the table together. We'll just sit there for hours, and it's something I really love. So that's something to really embrace. Number five is understanding Italian menus. Now in the United States and elsewhere, you have a single plate typically, right? That has a main dish on it, some kind of focal point, and then you have your side dishes. Italians don't mix their menu items, <laughs> which is why you typically don't see buffets in Italy. So this buffet idea I was talking about, that's not a thing. Again, maybe in large chain hotels, maybe on a joyful vegan trip, but but it's pretty un-Italian to do that. And I'm, you know, when I say that, I mean the breakfast. We have the breakfast buffet. We don't have buffets for other for other meals, to be to be honest. We don't, not when we're in Italy. Other trips, yes, because this doesn't matter as much. But for our, when we are having our dinners on any of our um, Italy trips, they're not buffet. Uh, the buffet I'm referring to is the breakfast buffet. But it's very un-Italian to have a pl single plate that has all these things mixed together, your main dish, your side dishes, your vegetables. You just wouldn't do that. So here's the breakdown. You've seen this, no doubt, on an Italian menu at home, wherever you live. You've seen this breakdown. So let me explain what it means. So first you have the antipasto, and the antipasto is the appetizer course, and that's where you'll find your bruschetta and your crostini and caponata. You might find the marinated vegetables, olives. You know, they're meant to be small plates, they're meant to be the appetizer. You might find the larger things, like a caponata will be on an appetizer course, but they're kind of smaller, they're smaller appetizer-y kind of things. It's a really great way to start the meal. You can order just antipasto and then go right to secondo or primo, or you can skip the antipasto. You don't have to eat every one of these, <laughs> every one of these. You don't have to eat from every one of these sections. And the antipasti, uh, you'll definitely find a lot of vegan options on the antipasto part of the menu. The next course is 
primo. And primo usually consists of pasta, depending on where you are. It could be penne, risotto, gnocchi. It could be zuppa. It could be soup. It doesn't have to just be pasta. But that's the primi course. And the primi course, or primo, is really one of the highlights. I, I actually love the primo because it's usually like a delicious pasta or, or a soup. And you'll also find a lot of vegan-friendly things on the primo. Not always. Depends on where you are. You can make sure they don't have cheese on a pasta dish and ask about, you know, whether there's anchovies in the sauce or what have you and the ragu, where, where, whatever. But the point is, that's what um, that's another course that vegans will order from. Antipasto a primo. The secondo course is the main course, and it's typically animal flesh, whether it is from the land or sea. So it's either going to be land animal, land animal flesh, or it's going to be aquatic animal flesh, fish, meat, that kind of thing. So the, the, it ten, the main dish tends to be accompanied by contorni, which are side dishes, but you have to order them separately. So your secondo is pretty much going to be just like whatever that main dish is. And then you can pair it with a, a contorno according to your preference. And so the contorni is another part of the menu you're going to see. It's not really a course. It's the side dishes. And people will add side dishes to their secondo to their main dish to their main course but the contorn the contorno section is where you're also going to find a lot of plant-based foods so you're going to find sauteed greens whatever's in season potatoes maybe french fries vegetables grains so you're going to find a lot so when I first started going to Italy, that's kind of where I focused. And if you go to an authentic Italian restaurant wherever you live in the States or UK or Australia or Germany, wherever you are, uh, you will find that the, if it's an authentic Italian restaurant, contorni are going to be uh, something you can just like pull from and you can order a bunch of uh, contorni and they're delicious. And then the next course is dolce. So antipasto, primo, secondo, dolce. And the dolce is the dessert. And you're going to find the tiramisu, the panicata, cannoli, fresh fruit, gelato. Again, you're not going to find a lot of vegan desserts on a typical uh, Italian menu in, in the States or in Italy, but on a joyful vegan trip. you will. In fact, you're going to beg us to stop feeding you dessert. And then the next, well, part of the dessert course, and, and you can skip dessert, but the next thing that is very typical among Italians is having coffee. And this is when you would have, you can have a cup of espresso, you can have um, some a macchiato, but what you cannot have, and we'll talk more about this when I get to the coffee section, you cannot have a cappuccino. You cannot have a cappuccino. And I'll explain why. Okay, I'll explain why now. They're only for breakfast. At least they're only before noon. They're not for any time after noon. So the macchiato, and again, you'll find, I shouldn't say again, you will find, by the way, plant-based milks in a lot of bars in Italy. These days they have avena, which is oat. They'll have uh, soya. They'll have soy. They'll have almond. They will have plant-based milks. Most bars have plant-based milks these days. So you will find that. And so even if you get a macchiato, which is, you know, what is it, espresso with like some milk foam, you can find a macchiato vegan. You can find a cappuccino vegan in the morning. But if you walk into a bar and you ask for a latte, they're going to give you a glass of cow's milk. That's what latte means. <laughs> so just know that. And so know that after dinner, if you order a cappuccino, they might not give it to you. They might actually deny you and just say no, um, or they're going to be very unhappy with you, or they're just going to roll their eyes, or they're just going to know you're not Italian. I'm sure there's other ways they're going to know you're not Italian, but it is not a thing. And I, I am not saying this with emphasis because I've ever experienced this because I don't drink coffee, which I'm surprised I'm even led into this country as many times as I have been, because coffee is such a huge part of Italian culture. But I'm saying this because it is probably if Italians had to whittle down the like one rule, it would be do not order cappuccino. Do not have cappuccino um, after noon, after 12 noon-ish, only for breakfast. So after dinner, you can have an espresso. But you can also have a, a digestivo, a digestive. Italians take a proper digestion very seriously. <laughs> it's kind of one of the reasons they don't 
allow, probably too strong a word, it's one of the reasons they frown upon having uh, cappuccino in the late afternoon or after dinner is because of the milk, the cow's milk usually that's in it, hinders digestion. I would say cow's milk hinders digestion, Italians, by the way, whatever time you have it, because we are not meant to digest the proteins and the sugars in animal milk because we are not baby anything anymore by the time we are consuming cow's milk into adulthood or with cappuccino. So that's their reason, I would say, then don't ever have any cow's milk. But digestion is a big deal. And so a digestivo is something that Italians will often have at the end of the meal, whether or not they have the coffee. Sometimes they'll even pour the uh, digestivo into the coffee, like a grappa they can put into a coffee. Um, But you'll find that at the end of the meal, and that could be like something bitter, some kind of digestive is what you'll often find at the end of the meal as well. So those are the courses of a typical Italian menu. You don't have to order all of them at all. You can have just the antipasto, you know, antipasto course and the contorno. You can have the antipasto and the primo. I am going to suspect you're not going to order the secondo a lot because, like I said, it's typically animal flesh. So... Moving on to rule number six, I wanted to talk a little bit about salads separately because as you heard, I didn't really mention salads a lot in the menu items. I mentioned vegetables and you will find plenty of those. But as far as salads go, they are typically served as a contorno. So you, someone who has a secondo, like someone who has meat, like will probably have a salad as well. They'll often maybe be a little bit on the side of the plate, maybe, but you will mostly find them as a contorno on a separate plate. And they're not going to be fancy schmancy. You, typically, you will find insalata verde, which is a green salad. And that will be like some kind of green lettuce, arugula. You might have some tomatoes. You might have some cucumbers. You might have some mixed herbs. You might have some carrot shreds or, you know, olives. But that's pretty much it. Insalata verde is very simple. And the dressings are, us- or for- first of all, they're always served on the side and the dressings usually oil and vinegar because the olive oil especially in Toscana especially in Umbria just in the central part but even in the south well I'll stick with the central part in the south is where you'll the olive oil is so good in the north you have uh, butter more But the olive oil is just so good in Italy that you don't need anything more than just a really nice olive oil and a really nice vinegar aceto. And that might be um, balsamic, could be red wine. You can ask for different types, but that's typically what you're going to find as your dressing for a salad. You're not going to find heavy dressings. Don't ask for a ranch dressing. If you get a ranch dressing, you are in a tourist restaurant or you're in some massive hotel. If you want to experience an insalata verde like Italians do, just have a simple salad with oil and vinegar salt salt and pepper that's what I put on mine and I find them really satisfying and really delicious okay moving on we're going to get into some serious territory here now folks we're getting into some serious serious material I'm even going to give you a trigger warning because what I'm about to share with you may very well be controversial it may be against it may go against everything you believe in but if you want to eat like an italian you're going to want to listen very carefully we are about to get into the bread etiquette very serious topic number one i know this might upset some of you and some of you might say no i'm gonna break that rule you can do that but I would choose which rules you break very carefully. <laughs> there are some rules I break, and I'll tell you which ones I do. I obviously break the cappuccino one because I don't drink coffee, so that one's easy for me. You might want to break this rule, but bread is not an appetizer. Bread is not an appetizer. We're used to, Americans especially, even in Italian restaurants in the United States, we are used to having bread before the meal, right? We're used to having a little bit and we put some olive oil and the thing, right, right? Mm-mm-mm. That is not what Italians do. Now, there's an exception. The exception is if in the antipasto section of the menu there is bruschetta or crostini, you can get bread. Okay, crostini usually is just grilled. So bruschetta means um, burnt. It basically means grilled. Please say bruschetta. 
the ch in italian is a k k sound like chianti okay bruschetta bruschetta is you know grilled bread usually with some oil some garlic some tomatoes maybe some basil crostini is typically just grilled brushed with some olive oil maybe sometimes garlic so you can get a crostini but asking for just a basket of bread not a thing you're going to find it in some places but that's not really typically italian and so First of all, you can get your bruschetta. I will never deny you that because I love bruschetta. But don't ask for a basket of bread. Now, here is another exception to the rule. Often on a lot of tables, even in Italy, um, and you know, you know, like American Italian restaurants, is, you know, breadsticks. Those little breadsticks, usually like in a little paper, you know, packaging. Don't tell me that they expect people to not eat those before the food comes, I'm just going to say. So that's okay. If they put some little breadsticks for you, go for it. But the point is, bread is considered a part of the meal, not an appetizer. And here's the next thing. You might revolt at this point. You might stop listening. This is not my rule, but do not dip bread in olive oil. (gasps) I know. Don't do it. Don't do it, <laughs> especially since it's presuming that you've got a basket of bread and you've, you've asked for that. So you've already broken rule number one, and now you're breaking rule number two, which is dipping it in olive oil and vinegar, that kind of thing. The idea is that bread is meant to be the accompaniment to the meal itself. That's the point of the bread in an Italian meal. And so we complain that the bread in Italy tends to be pretty tasteless. And I'm not talking, by the way, I also have to say another exception would be like focaccia, right? Or pizza, tav, you know, taglio or like uh, um, uh, pizza. Obviously, those are bread items. You can get focaccia, like, and you can get your bruschetta. That's different. But I'm talking about like this basket of bread we're used to, right? So, and, and when we talk, I mean, again, I love ciabatta. It's one of my favorite breads. Um, there's lots of really good breads. But typically speaking, bread in Italy, Italy is pretty tasteless because there's no salt, especially in Tuscany, in Umbria, in that kind of central part of of Italy. It tends to lack salt, so it tends to lack flavor. But here's the point, that's the point, is that the non-salty bread is there to accompany the salty dishes. So whatever you're eating as your main dish or your soup, the idea is that that's already flavored right? Your soup is already flavored, your risotto, whatever. Well, actually, that's another rule. Mm, let's not talk about risotto and, and, and uh, bread. The idea is that the bread is there to pick up the flavor of the flavorful main dish or primo. Okay. The other rule is that you don't eat starches with starches. So we're used to pasta and bread being served together. I mentioned risotto, that's, that's a starch. And bread served together. No, mm-mm, no, 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 no. You can see that Italians do not shun their starches at all. But eating starches with starches, no. So bread and pasta, not a good combination. You don't want them together. I just love that. I just think it's such a simple, I don't know, obvious, obvious rule. So you can save the bread for soup and you can save it to kind of like, you know, pick up some of that soup and we'll talk about that. But Starches with starches, Mm -mm. you don't want to have your bread with your pasta. Okay, here's another thing. No butter. Don't ask for butter. Don't ask for butter. Non-dairy butter or not. Don't ask for it. Even on a joyful vegan trip, I'm not going to let you have it because the the oil is so good. Butter is typical in the northern part of Italy, but it's just not a thing on bread. Again, it's because the bread is not there to be eaten on its own. The bread is there to accompany the meal. Using bread to clean your plate, this one's a bit controversial because in Italian culture, while the bread is not served with the pasta dish and it might be served with soup, it's not served on its own. There are cases where I'm thinking of a pasta dish, but don't think of a pasta dish because you're not going to have your bread with your pasta. But let's think of a soup. So can you mop up leftover soup, (laughs) the bottom of the bowl, with some bread? Yes and no. So it's actually a thing. There's a name for it. It's called fare la scarpetta, which means um, making a shoe with the bread. Fare la scarpetta con il pane means making a little shoe. Scarpetta means little shoe. And so there's a name for it, which means it's allowed 
and permitted because it's a sign of the you enjoying your meal. Like it means that you loved the meal so much. You don't want to waste any of it. And it's a real compliment to the chef. It's a real compliment to the cook. And so in finer establishments, I would say, "Mm, don't do that. Like, you know, I don't, there's certain things we wouldn't do in finer restaurants that we would do in right more casual places. So in more casual places, sure. At a friend's house and family, absolutely, because it's an absolute compliment. (laughs) But if you're in a nice fine dining establishment, I wouldn't use the bread to kind of mop up your soup. The other thing you don't want to do regarding bread, I know there's a lot of rules about bread. I told you, I could have just done an episode just on bread. I actually have episodes in the wings about bread in Italy. So the other rule about bread is you don't waste it. It is considered incredibly rude to waste bread bread. (laughs) So you don't want to just leave bread. Take only as much as you need if there is bread available for your soup, for instance. But if there's extra left over, then you can make the best salad on the planet, which is the panzanella. You've heard me talk about panzanella before, but you, but that's the idea is, you know, Italians, the, you know, cucina uh, povere, the idea that we don't waste food. You can definitely have a panzanella, which is a bread salad. And it really, started because there was bread left over from the the meal the night before, for instance, and you want to make use of that bread. Garlic bread, not a thing. So there will be times where you will see crostini con olio and aglio. So you're going to see crostini with oil and garlic, which is, you know, technically garlic bread. But looking for garlic bread, like on the menu, the garlic bread that we're used to, you're just not going to find it. Like, I mean, you're just not going to want it. There's just plenty of other ways to enjoy the, the regional typical dishes. But I hope, I hope you're okay. I hope you're okay. Because those rules I know can be really jarring. Now we're going to get into some other ones, which I don't think this is going to upset you as much, but we're going to get into pizza etiquette. So this is number eight. Pizza, respect the pizza. So I've said ad nauseum on this podcast that the original pizza in Italy, in Naples, was the pizza marinara. And that is the pizza with just the marinara sauce, the pizzas, you know, just the pizza sauce, and no cheese, no cheese at all. Now, there are wonderful restaurants these days making margarita with margarita pizzas with cashew-based cheeses, and you'll find that sometimes in Italy as well, definitely on our trips you will. But typically speaking, my fa- my favorite pizza is still the pizza marinara. I just want pizza with great sauce, you know, really good crust, really good sauce, some oil just kind of drizzled on it, maybe some oregano, maybe some basil, basilico, basta. That's it. I love it. It's my favorite. So you're vegan, you're listening, you're like, well, I'm not going to ask for the toppings that are, you know, only American and not Italian because most of those are going to be... Uh, you know, meat and that kind of thing. But I will say, you know, pizza in Italy isn't meant to have, you know, five different toppings on it. So that's kind of frowned upon. So if you are getting a pizza, even if it's a marinara and you want some toppings on it, you can ask for some basilico. You might ask for some olives, some olive, but maybe not, uh, hey, can I have like sun-dried tomatoes, olives, basil, um, um, you know, roasted red peppers and oregano? I don't know. Just the idea is to appreciate just, you know, the very sim- the simplicity of pizza. Please do not ask for pizza with um, pineapple because <laughs> they will definitely run you out of the country. Hawaiian pizza, not a thing. But also, not only is it not authentic, Italians don't really mix sweet and salty together. So that's one of the reasons Hawaiian pizza is kind of just not just frowned upon. It's just not un- like it's not understood. I don't understand it either, to be honest. I'll be really honest. And I think I think kind of the Hawaiian pizza idea is the, it's the sweet with salty, right? Because it's the pineapple Hawaiian pizza typically also has like ham. Not for me. No, non per me. Okay. One pizza per person. The pizza, they're usually personal size wherever you go. And, you know, you can split it, obviously, with a friend. But the idea is that you get your own pizza and they expect you to finish it. Doggy bags are not a thing in Italy. So you're expected to finish what you order. So be mindful of that. Don't overorder. But it's actually... I know it's I know it's wasteful, but if you don't finish what you order, they're not going to give you a doggy bag. They like most places don't even have containers for you to take unless you have them with you. So either finish it or you're going to leave it on your plate or give it to your 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 um your 
lunch mate because that's that's the thing. Pizzas are often served unsliced. This is something that's very interesting and it's related to what I just said. So you tend to get a pizza that hasn't been cut. The reason you cut pizza is because you're you're not eating your own, you're sharing it. But as I just said, eating your own pizza is kind of more of a thing in Italy. It's not to say that you can't share and I don't want to make it sound like you can't, but but typically that's, you know, you get your own pizza. And so you're expected to cut your own or tear your own pizza. So you'll get just a whole pizza and it won't necessarily be cut into the little triangular shapes that we do here. And that's, you know, sometimes you'll get that, but not all the time. The other thing, which is weird, and this is definitely a rule I break. I'm going to be really honest. This is a rule I break. And that is um, don't eat pizza with your hands. Because it's considered kind of inappropriate. Not rude, but like inappropriate. No. Especially in a nicer full service restaurant, maybe I'll follow this rule. But I don't know, like even in like pizzeria, like I'm gonna eat with I'm gonna eat pizza with my hands. I find it really strange to eat pizza with a knife and fork, but that's kind of what Italians do. That's what we're talking about here. So you decide if you want to break that rule. Another rule that I break is Italians, the only time well, I shouldn't say the only time, the drink that is typically drunk, the beverage that's typically drunk with pizza is not wine, it is beer. And I don't drink beer, so I break this rule because I do really like pairing wine with red sauce. Um, so and obviously, depending on where I am, but you know, like a nice Chianti with a pizza, I love it. But typically speaking, beer is drunk with pizza. Sometimes I'll have beer. Sometimes I just don't really like beer. I feel like it's just a waste of calories <laughs> because it's always just beer. I do like German beer. I do like like white beers. I do like Kolsch. You know, maybe a half of ice and sometimes maybe a pilsner, but not really. Like I like the lighter beers, but I still I'd rather just have water. And so when you're having your pizza, sparkling water, carbonated water is also something that's typical with pizza. But that's also a rule I break because I do not like carbonated water. I like l'acqua naturale. I do not get frizzante, which is what you'll be asked if you want um, carbonated or or I should say natural or carbonated, frizzante, but I don't like it. But again, it's like a digestion thing for for Italians. <laughs> the carbonated uh, water is believed to aid digestion, and I'm sure it does, but that's the thing. They're really into digestion. Okay, so that's the pizza. Those are the pizza rules. There you go. Now we're going to move on to the gelato rules. I know, I told you these were very serious at this point. Bread, pizza, gelato. And now we're in the gelato. And so rules about gelato, it's really mostly for you to be able to determine authentic uh, gelaterie versus inauthentic. And so here's some ways to know that you're at a really good gelato place. I mentioned also in previous episodes about how you will typically find vegan flavors. um, I hate hate saying that. You will typically find flavors that vegans can, you know, um, order that are made with plants that are not with animal products. And most every uh, gelateria that I've been in has a vegan gelato. But, and, 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 and I've talked about some of the, the, the flavors that are typically vegan, that's like pistachio, like pistachio, and um, fragola, obviously, the fruit um, uh, gelato, gelato t- um, tends to be vegan. But the pistachio, the hazelnut, peanut, chocolate, chocolato, like they tend to be the vegan ones and like it's the best like those are my favorites anyway look for kind of like handmade signs you know like that they just kind of wrote themselves like that's gonna be that's gonna mean that they're kind of changing the the menu if you will the flavors the gusti based on you know kind of what's local and what's available one of the signs of an authentic gelateria is that you will see the the gelati the, the gelato in metal containers that are covered because obviously you want to keep them cold and you know just protected from like people breathing all over them so they are usually in they should be in metal metal containers but if you a kind of a more of a touristy place. They're going to show you like all of the gelato just like on display and they're going to be bright colors. And that's the other thing to look for. The, if the colors are really super, super, super vibrant and bright, 
they're probably adding additives. They're probably adding colorings and flavorings. Um, and so that's probably something you want to avoid. You know, pistachio is like a really pretty muted green and, and fragola, strawberry, is like a really pretty, um, you know, pinkish red. It's not going to be like this really deep, dark red. So look for the colors. Look at the ingredients list. Some of them will have ingredients displayed. You can even ask them, and, you know, but you'll be able to tell if there's additives. And seasonal flavors is what I was getting at earlier. So in terms of, you know, kind of what's in season now, they'll they'll change it up. And then follow local recommendations if you know some locals and you can ask them. Again, kind of the same rule I gave earlier. If it's off the main square, you're going to probably find more typically kind of more authentic, but that's not always the case. For instance, in San Gimignano, which is part of our Toscana trip, we are, we're right across from San Gimignano at our villa. And apparently they have the, you know, gelato um, competitions every year. And San G- two gelaterie in G- San Gimignano won for f- the first and second place for, for best gelato in Italy. And they're right on the main square in San Gimignano. So it's not always the case. But sometimes. Okay, moving on to number 10, let's get into beverages. So I spoke a little bit about kind of wine and beer, but there's a lot more to say. Water, water etiquette. Tap water, even though it is safe to drink everywhere in Italy for the most part, like most developed countries, um, is not drunk in restaurants. So don't ask for it. They won't necessarily find it rude, but again, it's kind of like just not the norm. And especially in upscale restaurants, they are going to bring you bottled water. When you sit down, they are most likely going to ask you if you want natural or if you want sparkling. So aqua naturale or aqua frizzante. And that's it. And then when you want more water, you ask for another bottle. You're not saying, can I have tap water? It's just really not, really not a thing. I keep saying it's not a thing because I just don't want to make it sound like, you know, you can't do it. It's not like, you know, forbidden, (laughs) but it's just not a thing. So when it comes to water, you will get charged. It's very rare that um, you'll get tap water for free. I know that in the United States, that's a thing, you know, we just get tap water and it's, it's free, but that's just not the case in, in Italy. You will get bottled water. There is a cost. And if you do want more, you will ask for more and you will pay for that. So that's typically how it works. Again, the tap water is fine. And most Italians know this. Most of the water comes from the north, from the mountains, but it's just not a thing to drink it in Italy. Here's another thing. This one doesn't impact me very much because I don't drink Coke. I don't drink soda. I don't, I don't drink my water with it, but Italians don't really like ice. <laughs> they don't really use ice much. So asking for ice, it's going to be a tell. It's going to be a tell that you're not Italian. So even if you order a can of Coke, if you order a can of soda, they will bring you, the server will bring you, uh, the camerieri will bring you a can and a glass and pour the soda into the glass, but not with ice. You can ask for ice and they'll bring it, but you might get a raised eyebrow and you might want to learn some, you might learn some Italian at that point because they're probably going to have something to say (laughs) at that moment. Okay, moving on to like drinks and cocktails and beer. So we talked about beer, soda, beer, carbonated water with pizza. I break that rule. I have wine. But when it comes to cocktails, cocktails are not for drinking during dinner. Wine, beer, Water, options at dinner, not cocktails. Cocktails are for aperitivo and to drink at the bar with your friends, right, or wherever you are, the restaurant. They're not meant to accompany your lunch or dinner. So that's something to know. Beer is fine at dinner time. Wine, especially. We'll talk more about that. Beer brands are like Morena, Moretti, Peroni, you've heard of. Those are typical beer brands you'll find on menus in Italy. There are fewer local craft brewers, but they're popping up more around Italy, but you'll typically see kind of the bigger ones like Peroni on the menu. Wine definitely can be enjoyed during the aperitivo, even though the aperitivo usually is, like I said, cocktails and Prosecco is like what you'll typically find also during aperitivo. Um, I don't, I, I can't, I don't, it's no rule, but I, you know, I, I break the rule. I don't tend to have cocktails at aperitivo. I tend to have wine. Now, the cocktails that are really popular in Italy, especially in the north, and we have this in Venice a lot on our trips, is the uh, spritz. Uh, Brighty um, turned us on to spritz. Well, didn't turn me on to it because I don't like spritzes. 
I can say that it's a German word, so I'm not sure. Spritzes. I don't like spritz because typically it's made with sparkling wine, like a Prosecco. And then there's a dash of a bitter liqueur, uh, like Campari or Aperol. So typically you get an Aperol spritz, but like every region has their own kind of variation. And, and then by the way, there's sparkling mineral water as well. But typically the spritz is Aperol, but, and you can also make it with Campari and that just makes it even more bitter. I don't like bitter f- flavors. And so I don't like a spritz at all, but it's very refreshing. I know for people when it's a hot day and we have these in abundance during our, especially our Northern Italy trip, but down in the southern part, you can have it as well. So that's the idea of aperitivo wine. Pair your wine um, with your meal. You can certainly ask your server for some recommendations and you will, you know, really enjoy the meal more. And we do that with a lot of our meals, especially in Tuscany when we're at our villa. We have our own villa And we're drinking wine that is grown within like 10 miles from our villa. And it's really special. And so we we really were mindful of that on our trips. But also you can ask your server um, when you're on your own. The other thing about alcohol, I want to say, you know, Italians certainly enjoy wine. They do enjoy their drinks. No doubt about it. I mean, children, you know, (laughs) young kids will have wine as part of their meal. But they don't tend to get drunk. It's a very interesting thing, like especially at the aperitivo. The idea is to have like a drink or two, but it's really about interacting with friends. It's really about the social aspect of it. It's not you're not there to get drunk. So be mindful of that. If you're at your aperitivo for two hours, then just, you know, kind of nurse the drinks for that time because you might even have some wine at dinner, which is fine to have wine then at dinner as well. But just be mindful is that um, don't rush through your drinking. Don't rush through your drinks either at the aperitivo or during your dinner. Toasting is very common and it's a lovely gesture of of camaraderie and respect. And so (laughs) toasting is really special and it's very customary to make eye contact when you toast. You can say salute. That's probably the most common toasting expression, salute, to to our health. You can also say alla nostra to us or alla tua to you. So to our health, to, to, to your health, you can say that. Alla nostra, alla tua or salute. You can say chin chin. It's kind of an older it's like chin 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 is what it is it's an older toasting expression it's fallen out of fashion um for the most part it's not very contemporary i don't think a lot of young kids will say it but you can say it and then you raise your glass toward the center of the table that's the correct way to toast you can clink your glasses it's not wrong but it's not very common and this is definitely something I was really happy to take home with me because I actually don't like clinking glasses. I find the whole idea of clinking glasses jarring when I'm, especially with more than four people or more than, when there's more than four of us, because you have a table and you're all around the table and someone might be way far away from you and everyone's just making sure they clink the glasses as opposed to really being present about what the toast was and looking each other in the eye, and really taking in that moment. So for me, when I found out that Italians don't really like clinking their glasses, I was like, yes, that's me. Maybe that's how I knew I was Italian. (laughs) Maybe that's how I knew I had Italian blood, is because I don't like doing it. And so now it's really sweet. My friends know this about me now. Um, David knows this about me. And it, it has become a bit of a a bit of a battle because, you know, sometimes because they want to clink and I don't. And so if it's just a small group of us, usually they'll honor my raising of the glass. And it is so much nicer because you're not like, oh, did I get you? Did I get you? Did I clink your glass? Did I clink your glass? Let me get you. Hold on. I got to get up and clink it. What? No. The whole point was to like say to your health, to you, look you in the eye, take a sip. That's to me like how a special toast is done. And so thank you, my friends, who are um, trying to accommodate me on that. And sometimes they're like, no, I want to clink. I'm like, fine. Oh, God, I hate it. (laughs) So that's definitely something I've taken home with me. Number 11 is the coffee culture. I made some references to it already. Your cappuccino, you're going to really only want to have that at breakfast time. And you're going to be ordering them in a bar. You're not going to have it after midday. You're not really going to have it after meals. So it's the same thing. Again, the idea of the digestion. And you're going to really enjoy the art of the espresso. I can't say I have because 
I don't drink coffee, <laughs> but 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 you will if you like coffee because it really is really special. I love the smell, I love the aroma in a bar, but I do not love the taste. And so you can get like, you know, if you just go, and, and remember what I said, if you go order a latte, you're just going to get a glass of milk. And so you can say un café macchiato, you can say un café normale, which just means like a regular coffee, just like your espresso. You can get a double you can, you know, whatever, learn more from someone else who knows, who knows from coffee. Me, I don't really drink tea when I'm there out. I bring my tea with me because I love drinking it in the morning, wherever we stay. But yeah, when we're out, I don't really drink tea because tea is not a thing in Italy. And I would rather no tea than, than, than gross tea. It's faschifo is just not good at all. Number 12 is finish your meal. I said this a little earlier about, you know, there's not really going to be, um, you know, I say doggy bag, but that's what we call it, right? You're not going to really have a takeaway container, but also like the idea is that you're there to enjoy it. And if it takes you longer to sit there longer, to finish your meal, then do it. If you are at a restaurant and you left some pizza, I don't know why you would, okay. But if you are at like a family gathering, it would be very rude for you to not finish your food. So restaurant is okay, eh, family gathering, don't you dare. And I would say if the restaurant is like more of a trattoria, that's a family restaurant or an osteria, you're going to want to finish your meal. Tip from the hip. Number 13, tipping. Tipping is not a thing in Italy. It's not expected. It is not common. Italians don't leave tips, do not feel obligated to do so. You can, but it is not necessary. It's just not part of the culture. You're not doing anything wrong by not leaving a tip. I know it's really hard. And that's one of the things that's kind of lovely. You know, our travelers, us, you know, Americans, I think are pretty generous. And it's really lovely. We feel really bad if we're not leaving a tip. <laughs> but you don't have to leave a tip. There is something in Italy, and you'll see it on the menu. It's called the um, coperto. Coperto refers to a cover charge or a service charge um, that is meant to cover the table service. And the amenities provided to the diners, like the tablecloth and the glasses, so that's that's what it is. It's like a ta- it's a cover service um, charge, and so it goes back to when people would go to a taverna and they would bring their own food. So they'd be like you know traveling on foot, maybe they're on the pilgrimage road, the pilgrim road, and they would they would stop at a ta- tavern for maybe a beer, but they would have their own food and uh, they would charge they would be charged a coperto. So you'll still see that on. Um, the bill today. Don't be alarmed by it. Next, the bill. Do not wait for a server to bring you a bill. This is all in the same tips. Don't wait for them to bring you a bill. You have to ask for the bill. If someone brings you the bill before you request it, it's kind of considered rude because it makes it seem like they're rushing you to leave. So when the meal concludes right, or when your sobremesa is done, you can request the bill by saying il conto per favore to your server and wait for it to be brought to your table. It's typically customary to pay the bill at the cash register, then leaving money on the table, but often they will also come, you know, with the charge uh, machine at the t- to the table. That's typically what is done, okay? So that is number 13. Number 14, and we're wrapping up here, I wanted to mention buying produce in food markets because, you might not just be eating in restaurants. You might go to a market and you might want to either buy produce because maybe you have an Airbnb and you want to make your own food or you just want to get some produce to have like as a picnic. Do not touch that produce unless you were invited to. It's typically considered impolite to touch the fruits and vegetables without permission from the vendor. You can ask the vendor for assistance. You can point to the produce that you would like to purchase and they will gladly help you. Often in a, you know in like more of a grocery market, not just an open air market, you will find gloves or utensils, and you be expected to use those disposable gloves. Use the tongs so you don't have this more waste in the world. Um, but to handle certain produce items like fruits or nuts, they're you're expected. Hygiene is a big deal in Italy. Bidets. Need I say more? Bidets. Bidets. So hygiene is a thing, and so they do not want you to touch that produce. Do not touch it. Ask them for help. Number 15, you can't be too polite at any of these places. You walk in, you say buongiorno, you say buonasera, you say per favore, you say grazie in every way, in every interaction you are having with someone in Italy. Respect. 
is go so far. You cannot be too polite. You cannot be too respectful. So say buongiorno. You wouldn't walk in and say ciao to like anyone in a restaurant. Like if you don't know the person, you're not going to say ciao. So you would, so, you know, good morning is more formal. Good, you know, buongiorno, good day, buongiorno. Buonasera in the evening. Buona serata when you're leaving. And buona giornata when you're leaving. But ciao is very casual. So if you don't know them, if you don't know the people, buongiorno, buona giornata, buonasera, buona serata. So when you're leaving, you say buona serata, have a good evening. When you're coming, buonasera, good evening. Right, so when you're arriving, you say buongiorno. When you're leaving, you say buona giornata. So you cannot, and grazie, 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 and per favore. Everything you say, il conto per favore, scusi per favore. Just, you can't, you can't be polite enough. So I hope that helps. I want to know what you would take away just hearing this, or when you are in Italy or other countries, I would love to hear from you what, you are taking away what you want to take away what you're inspired by what you want to be inspired by for me not clinking not drinking coffee just kidding uh, sitting for long periods of time really enjoying the time with friends and just relaxing and just enjoying being fully present being fully mindful hi there's just no better way while you're filling your belly while you're eating delicious food and drinking delicious wine So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope to see you on a joyful vegan trip, whether it's to Italy or any other place we go around the world. For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick-Goudreau. Thanks for listening. 